degrees, keep it 100. Uh, my two friends, Devin and John, along with our fathers, decided to do something similar to a TED Talk where we bring in people uh, from the community to, the, to talk about athletics, leadership, and certain aspects of life. This series airs on Zoom every Sunday at 7 p.m. In this series, you will have the opportunity to rub, to rub shoulders with giants, listen to their life stories and journey to get to where they are now. As the audience, you will be muted, but you will be able to ask questions and chat. Our chat monitors tonight will bring up your questions throughout the talk. Audience and chat, if you could please let us know who you are, where you're from, and how you heard about our program, we'd love to welcome you. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on our show, please contact us. We've organized uh, our time to start out with learning about our speakers growing up in the years, then educational slash training years in their career. Um, I just want to take a moment to introduce the interviewers and the chat monitors tonight. Um, so, uh, Mr. Coleman, John, Devin, Mr. Rossica, and Reggie. And Mr. Wilson, if I didn't mention him already. Um, this week's speaker is uh, Bob Smith, Mr. Smith. Uh, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Um, our Keep It 100 team and the audience are so glad you could take the time to join us this Sunday night. This program started out in hopes that we and the audience could have the distinct opportunity to rub shoulders with some giants and learn from them so we can be better leaders ourselves and people in the communities and respective callings in our lives. So I just want to share a short bio about um, Mr. Smith. So our guest this week is uh, of U.S. great national soccer players and local standout Robert Bobby Smith. Bob Smith was born March 29, 1951, and grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, and attended Steinert High School in Hamilton Township, New Jersey. After high school, he attended Ryder University in Lawrence, New Jersey from 1969 through 1972. While at Ryder, he played four seasons on the men's soccer team. He holds a college record for the most goals in the season and career. In 1997, Ryder University inducted Smith into its Hall of Fame. In his professional career, he played for the Philadelphia Adams, North American Soccer League, NASL, expansion franchise, which drafted Smith in the second round of 1973 college draft. He played professional in the U.S. with world reowned all-time soccer um, player, great, uh, I phrased that wrong. He played with um, the U.S. world reowned all-time soccer great Pele and Giorgio uh, Canalia. In addition, he played overseas with a first division club in Ireland. When the Cosmos signed Pele, Pele insisted the Cosmos surrounded him with good supporting teammates, and Cosmos went to shopping for Bobby Smith and some other key players. That year, that year, um, Smith took home the second team All-Star honors as Team Adams ran into the NASL championship title. They set a record that season for allowing only 14 goals. Mr. Smith continued to be recognized as one of the leader's top defenders in 1974. He was an all-star honorable mention third team in 1975 and became the first native born U.S. player in the, NA, in the NASL to earn the first team all-star recognition. After retiring from playing professionally, Smith returned to, the, to, the New Jersey, to New Jersey where he has coached youth soccer. He is the former owner of Smitty Kicks, currently runs the Bob Smith Soccer Academy in Robbinsville Township, New Jersey, and resides in Hamilton Square, New Jersey. In addition, Smith was selected as the Grand Marshal in 2008 Trenton St. Patrick's Day Parade. In 2007, he was officially inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. So uh, welcome, Mr. Smith. Thanks for joining us tonight. And um, if we can start off with your growing up years, um, can you tell us more about where you grew up and what that was like through your high school years? Okay, good evening, everybody. Um... I grew up in the, you know, in Hamilton. I was born in Trenton. I grew up in the Hamilton area. And there wasn't a whole lot of soccer being played then. And uh, there was a couple of uh, Irish guys on the street that we lived on that started getting a bunch of kids together playing. Hamilton Recreation League kind of just started then with 
guys that put it together, Ed Cater, uh, Albie Cal, and then th these, these coaches got this league going for the rec league. And we just started playing, we played soccer in the fall, basketball in the winter and baseball in the spring. So we were, you know, there was no such thing as year round, any sport actually, you know, your organized sports were only seasonal. So I played, you know, on the local teams up through um, junior high, we played at Reynolds and then I ended up, you know, playing at Steiner and uh, went on from there into college and, um, you know, played in a little bigger league and, in, uh, in Hamilton and uh, played competitive sports all my, all my life growing up. Cool. Um, John, you have any questions? Uh, yeah. Who are three key figures? Up? I didn't hear that, John. I'm sorry, I'm having connection issues. Okay. Who are three key figures in your growing up years? Three key figures in my growing up years? Yeah. Well, um, as far as sports go, I mean, as far as life goes, it's, you know, it's my dad. You know, he was a former World War II prisoner of war guy. So he was a pretty proud, proud American. I can remember him being like so by American back then. And you know, he was uh, probably the biggest influence growing up. And then it was college, it was coaches, you know. Um, a couple of soccer players that were older than me that I would look up to um, that were playing, um, you know, that were ahead of me that I was trying to like emulate growing up. Kenny Hess, one of them, and Bobby Roshan, another one. These are names of guys that were like the best soccer players in the Trenton area. And, you know, I was just looking up to them because soccer was really the only game I wanted to play. After about, I'd say, well, I played baseball through the st start of high school, you know, but uh, th then I just played soccer full time. Uh, once I was like 15, 16, soccer is the only game I played year round. Thank you. You're welcome. Devin, you have any questions for Mr. Smith? Uh, yes, I do. Um, Mr. Smith, can you share with us key events that helped you in your early life and helped to shape you who you are today? Uh, well, the things that make the biggest impression on you, I think, when you're young, growing up and playing sports is a sense of accomplishment at a young age that makes you feel some pride in yourself and it builds some confidence in you. I think that's the most important thing whether it's uh, something academically that you challenge yourself about and you care about. To me, I got all those feelings from sports. You know, I, I wasn't like, uh, you know, I wasn't killing it in the, in the, uh, in the algebra and the chemistry department too much. I was, you know, my, I, was, I was just, unfortunately, I was just so focused on my commitment to sports and to, to playing soccer um, that, you know, I was like, I mean, I can remember times when, like, this is a little known fact. I led the Nottingham Little League baseball in home runs when I was 11, okay? Just thought I'd throw that baseball trivia in there. <laughs> and these kinds of, of things, I mean, I can remember, let's see, see, I can remember playing on New Jersey State team when there was no Olympic development program. You guys know what that was, right? Whether you played, tried out for it or not. Devin, you guys know what the Olympic development program is? Yeah, yeah. So, so um. The first state team came along. Manfred Schelscheid put this team together. He was from Elizabeth, German guy from Elizabeth, New Jersey. And he put together a team, okay, of state players. And I can remember feeling like, for, like one of the first times, it's similar to like, let's say, making varsity as a sophomore and starting as a sophomore in high school and thinking like, wow, these guys are so much better than me. And starting to feel a sense of pride in yourself, which to me came through sports that first feeling. And I can remember being on that team. There was like five Trenton guys on that team, that state team, a bunch of guys from Kearney, Harrison, and, and North Jersey. And it was preparing this team to go to Germany. Manfred was taking us to Germany. And I'm telling you, that team was like so good. And, and I mean, that gave me like a sense of pride 
because it was like a reward of all the time you put into something, how much you care about something, and you get these moments, and I had quite a few, honestly, where you, 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 it builds your confidence in yourself and you feel proud of what you've achieved. And I was so proud of that team because I was out of Lake Hamilton. I mean, I love the teams I played in in Hamilton. Don't get me wrong. But when you step out, I had that feeling many times, actually, and you step out into a, of a different kind of environment and you're selected. I mean, I went from that kind of a feeling, which was so important there, to, I don't know, six, seven years later, I'm chosen for the U.S. national team. I mean, that's like the whole country, and they're picking 16 players, and I was one of them. I mean, these moments are huge for you. They give you some confidence. It, it, it develops your, your, your mental toughness and your pride in yourself. And they're just wonderful things through, through your young years. And you only get them from caring so much about something than achieving things. I was thinking about like comparing it to like, um, like something in science, the periodic chart, let's say. And that's, they have a contest in a classroom. And you're the kid that just gets every single one, symbol, you know what I mean? And you get an award for mm. it up in front of the room and you get a, I mean, that, that's, that's an accomplishment that, that I, I would think someone would be very proud of. I didn't win that award, by the way, but, you know, different things in different subject areas. Um, mine were sport related, how, how I began to feel a sense of pride in myself of, of getting rewarded for all the effort and all the time you're spending doing something because you care so much about it and you love, I loved every minute of it. I didn't, I didn't ever want to leave a soccer field. I, I loved the sport and I played, I can remember playing. I mean, I'm, I'm going to, I'm rambling a little bit now. You want, you want to come back to us another particular question? How you doing? No, go right ahead. Yeah. I can remember um, getting involved in situations where um, by, by putting so much effort and time commitment to something. And I just, I remember thinking that every game I played, to me was like the biggest game of my life kind of. I tried to like really make moments of, of being on the field be just so important. No game to me. Thought, and I can remember when I'm on the Cosmos, we're doing preseason down in Florida. And we were just scrimmaging a couple local college teams. And the guys are all like just kind of goofing around and it's no big deal. It's a training session for, for the Cosmos. But I'm out there. Now we're playing against college players. I'm only two or three years out of college. And I'm probably the only guy in the team that went to college in, in the States. I'm trying to think of a couple of guys. Maybe Shep Messing might have, might have done it. Riggs, Riggs did that. But now I'm thinking like these guys are right behind me. They're going to be wanting my job. And I'm going out there. And I took that game, that scrimmage, very seriously. Because to me, it meant a lot to show these younger guys why I'm where I am and how they, what they have to do to get to where I was. And I can just remember taking games and my sport so seriously because I, I cared so much about it. And uh, that's, that's the feeling that I had. And that's what benefited me. Any results I had in my life, uh, as far as my career went, I think came from that like focus and concentration and care about what I was doing on the field every minute, you know? Yeah, that's great. It really like brings up the lesson to never be too comfortable, you know, especially when you have such a high standing on a soccer team. Yeah, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't remember ever being comfortable as far as walking out there thinking that I'm here. And don't forget, I'm in a locker room with a lot of serious players. So the guys that aren't in that first team, and I, every time I was healthy, I was on the field. And that's the one thing I would always kind of demand of myself. And I was pretty upfront with my coaches too. You know, Reggie, I would talk to a coach and I would say, um, you know, Eddie Fermati would have to say, you, you know, I, you know I, I'm, your, I'm your guy. When the whistle blows, I want to be on that field. And if, if you don't think I am, you don't think I deserve to be, that's fine. Just do me a favor. Just move, move me out. Move me on because I, I, I want to play. I'm not going to be watching a lot of soccer here. And I, I had that feeling. And, I mean, it's easy to say, you know, I'm not saying, like, start me or, you know, you know I'm leaving. I just I'm – I'm a player. I did I – did, I, mean, I, I was like – I want to be on that field, the whistle blows. And any, I was on that Cosmos field every time I was healthy. And there were some serious players, serious players on that team, one through 25, and they wanted that spot. And I never let my guard down. It was felt comfortable in that position. I went out on fire every game, every training session, fitness levels. I mean, you had to be, I had to be so fit. My game was based on fitness and chasing somebody 90 minutes. I'm a defender. 
you know, and I've got to, I've got to be out there and I got to go. I can remember feeling like the last five minutes of a half, you, you guys that are players, last five minutes of a game, games are decided then. People are wearing down end of the first half, end of a game. And I can remember honestly feeling they're the, big, they're the big, best moments of my game then. I felt so comfortable at the end of the game, I'm not breaking down. And I prepared myself that way. And I love that feeling because I know I'm looking around the field and there, there is, everybody starts, you know, you're hurting a little bit. You're cheating some of your runs. You're not tracking people as far as you should. You're picking and choosing your moments to keep your intensity up. I felt very comfortable. You, you, and I always felt like with, with, coach, with coaching my, my kids' teams or whatever, you have to own those last 10 minutes or a half, last 10 minutes of a game. You have to own them. You have to be all over that because that's when games are decided. You know? So, um, Tony, Wilson, Reggie, do you have any questions from uh, the audience or maybe your own questions? Yeah, I, none from the audience just yet. And just audience, you can just chime in on the chat. Just type any questions you have. But, Bob, I do have a question about your childhood. You mentioned about your father and his important role in your life. What were the – maybe you can mention one to three lessons that he taught you that really resonated with you and you took with you going forward. Um, well, my dad was a little bit of like a no-nonsense kind of guy, you know. He was very quiet spoken, humble guy. Um, you know, I think his experience through the war situation stayed with him. Never talked a lot about it, never mentioned things about that, but he was, he, he was uh, such a, a loyal kind of a person. He would teach, he taught us, the, th the three boys, just like, um, just respect to the max and, you know, respecting people and a good work ethic. No, no, he's not letting you cut corners on anything. And, you know, he was very, he was strict. I'd have to say he was pretty strict. Nowadays, I mean, never any physical stuff, but just like he, he wanted you, you know, pay attention and focus on what you're doing and, and don't cut corners, you know? And I mean, a good example was that, uh, you know, he believed in that buy, buy American, America, American only kind of purchases in the house and things because he was that patriotic. National Anthem to his was like, you know, meant everything. That's why when I was, it meant a lot to me when I was playing for the national team and we'd be traveling all other countries and you're up there for that national anthem. And that's such a prideful thing to hear when you're in other countries, the national anthem going on with you on the national team. It's hard to explain. It was just an unbelievable experience. So he was mostly that way. I remember my brother coming home, my older brother coming home one day and he was in, uh, just and in college, he he'd gotten married as a freshman in college, raising a couple kids in college and working, working his, the whole time and trying to play soccer at Glassboro also. And he brought a Toyota into my, drive, my dad's driveway. I can remember it like yesterday. My dad was like, what are you doing with that car? And I can remember my brother Stanner saying, when, you, when, you're, when this country makes a car that I can afford and I can drive on my budget with what I'm doing, I'll buy your car. But right now you don't have it. And this is the car I'm driving. My dad was like, well, you, you know, he's, he understood him. He was like, you, you get that car to my driveway kind of a guy. So he was, you know, very pro-American kind of guy. That's what I learned most of him. Pride in this country. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. It means a lot. Yeah. Any other questions, uh, Wilson, Reggie? Uh, Mr. Smith, do you feel your high school soccer experience have uh, any impact in your college or professional career? Did it have any part in my college and professional career? Uh, I said, like, uh, your experience playing in high school right. has any impact in, in the college uh, or on your professional soccer life? Did they have any impact? Yeah, I mean, it prepared me for college. I mean, the discipline you're learning and the, the, the training and the fitness required to, to, go, to go, go on. I mean, I wouldn't have played college soccer without playing at Steiner High School. I mean, I got recruited out of, out of uh, Steiner by Ryder College. I mean, I got a free education. I got a full scholarship to go to Ryder because of my high school years. I mean, that was unbelievable at the time. And, uh, you know, my, my brother had just, ahead of me, had gone to Glassboro. My parents were, were a little tight affording that. So I don't know what I would have done if I hadn't had the opportunity to go to college on a scholarship. I really don't know uh, how that would have worked out without playing high school, high school uh, soccer. I, I loved high school soccer was like, 
we were strong. We had a strong team. We were always like we were state champs one year. We were always Steiner had some good programs. And way way before me, there were players that played at Steiner that were a lot better than I was too. And um, you know, we had some great teams. I loved high school soccer. Steiner, there, that that goes back to that feeling proud. I mean, the Steiner soccer program instilled pride in you and confidence in you. And we were always expected to do well, and we always we always did pretty well. You know, I love those years at Steiner. Thank you. Uh, do you remember? We have some young people on the call. Do you remember any challenges you had coming up through school, whether it was on the field or in the classroom? And could you talk about how you dealt with it? How'd you maybe even overcome it? Challenges in high school? High school or middle school? What, okay. what, anything uh, you remember that you could share? Uh, the challenges, uh, I don't know. I was just, we were just normal, normal upbringing, you know? Mom's home, dad's working. My dad was knocking on doors selling insurance. And, you know, um, our whole, our whole life was sports, really was. I mean, we, were, we, we played year round, every day, all day, as much as we could. We, we'd, um, I mean, challenges overcome in a classroom. I mean, you know, I was an average student, I gotta tell you that. And the reason I'd say that to you, that I would change, if I was doing that over again, I would apply myself academically as much as I did athletically. And I do regret that a little bit, you know? Um, I was just, I just got by and, and, and it was only because going back to what you care about, what you care about, you know, if you, if you, uh, the more you care about something, the better you're going to do at it. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with algebra and chemistry in these classes in high school, elementary, uh, elementary, I don't even remember. Uh, I, I was, you know, I was, I was okay. Elementary school. When it got a little bit tougher in, in the junior high school and, and high school, you know, I tried, I, I tried, I'm, I'm, I was a C student, you know? And I think it's only because I didn't apply myself. And I kind of regret that a little bit through college as well, that I didn't take more advantage. You know, kids today are so well-rounded. They're, they're all A's in class. They're, they're athletically, fitness-wise, diet-wise. I mean, they're just so head and shoulders above our age group preparing themselves, I think. I hope they have the heart that our, our generation had. And, you know, I, I look for that big time too, you know, that commitment, you know, but, um, I don't know, Reggie, as far as things that uh, I struggled with. I, I would have to say academically, you know, I was a little intimidated by some of the classwork and I just tried to get by, unfortunately. Thank you. So um, we're gonna move on to the, um, the college section of uh, like the questions we're gonna ask. So um, my question, is why did you decide to go to college and why did you choose Ryder University over other colleges? Um, well, I wanted to play soccer in college. Nobody was doing any recruiting of soccer players back in the late 60s. I got one letter from a Quinnipiac College in Connecticut. I never went there. There was no such thing as visitations. I'm telling you, for, compared to today, it's just a totally different world. I mean, you know, uh, you would just, you would, uh, I don't remember soccer scholarships being handed out before that. And actually, most of the players in Trenton that were better high school players went to Mercer County Community College. I can remember my parents uh, tell, telling me this is an, another one of those, those moments where they were, they were, you know, they were all over what, what I was doing in my, my, my path. And they did not want me going to junior college. I wanted to go to Mercer, junior, Mercer Community College. All the players went there. And they won national championships all the time. But they also had a reputation of, I don't know about many of them graduating. I don't know how about any of them went on academically to, to four-year colleges. It was a different time. They, they, they played soccer. And my parents wanted me getting an education and not just playing soccer in college and going to Mercer. So they, they uh, Ryder came along with a an opportunity to play. And it was the only offer I had to go to college. And, um, you know, I, uh, I went there. It's funny because me and Mike Strickland, he was my best friend growing up, went, went to, we're gonna go to Ryder College, full scholarship, both of us. I was so psyched. He was a great player. Two of us played up front for Steiner for a couple of years. Best friend of mine. 
that summer, like in August or so, I'm over his house one day and he's like, he says, hey, I, I don't think I'm going to go to Ryder. I said, Mike, what do you mean? We're, we're, you know, we're all set. He goes, we joined the Marines. So that fall, Mike's in Vietnam and I'm playing at Ryder and I'm thinking like, this world's crazy, you know? And uh, he would write me back letters of what he's doing and he, he's over there fighting in lily pads and I'm playing, ride, playing soccer at uh, behind Ryder College. So it was, it was very, that was very weird. That was during those Vietnam War years. And, um, you know, it's funny because my dad was, uh, you know, as much as he was a veteran, you know, uh, he wasn't big on, uh, that, that war wasn't big on him sending me to that, in, in, get involved in that war. He just, it was a conflict. He said, when your country decides to go to war with them, you know, I, his children would be first ones in line. And, he, you know, he would rather I have gone to college and, and not join the, join the Marines and, and get, went to Vietnam at that time. It wasn't very popular and it wasn't very surprising. It wasn't very popular with some veterans either. So, you know, did I even come close to answering your question? Uh, yeah, for sure. All right. Yeah. Um, John, do you have any questions for Mr. Smith? Yeah, Mr. Smith, uh, do you feel like with your friend going to the Marines while you went to Ryder, do you feel like that like helped you become more successful going into college and then later playing professionally? Well, I feel that I played professionally because I went through college, you know, instead of going into the service. I mean, it was, um, we didn't have a draft back then going into the service. So you either enlisted or, or you didn't have to go into the service, you know? But uh, I, I don't know that not going, I mean, I'd, I'd have to say that I got drafted to, to, out of college to play professional soccer. I didn't get drafted to go to Vietnam. But I went to, I, I went through, um, <laughs> my college years and got drafted because of the exposure to college soccer gave me that I wouldn't have gotten if I was in the military, I don't think, but it was tough for me not going, not going to, I was so torn back then. A lot of people were, my dad's a prisoner of war, World War II, you know, so to, for me to be like, well, I don't know, Vietnam or not, and I can remember being on campus as a writer and all these liberals from Princeton were coming on campus, anti-war guys, burning draft cards and burning flags. I remember going home and talking to my dad about it. And it was like, it was a very difficult time in this country. And I just kind of like, didn't know what to do. I'm not burning a draft, I'm not touching that flag. You know, my dad will burn my ass if I had to, you know, if, if I did something like that. So I was like, so it was a difficult time. I just, um, you know, I, I, I stayed in college and got drafted into the North American Soccer League. I went on to play professional soccer and, and, and didn't pursue the uh, military route. Uh, Devin, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, Mr. Smith, in your opinion, what are some key differences between like high school soccer and college soccer? Key differences? I think it's a pretty big jump, actually. You know, a lot of good high school players don't always make it to the college game. I don't know. I think the commitment's a lot stronger. Um, I mean, you got to be – really focus on that program and the competition's tougher. It's, you know, you get into division one, two or three and either one, you know, you get into those levels of college soccer. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty good, big commitment, especially for kids today. I have to say back then when I went to school and I played college, we didn't have a very good team. I remember, you know, almost all the players that play, I played with at Ryder played three months a year. They played, during the fall when the season's on. We didn't have a spring season. I would go and play for GAK or some other team year round. And these guys, they, they, you know, it, it bothered me a little bit that they didn't have a commitment to play year round and come back and our team would be better in the fall. I remember every fall coming back and these guys were starting all over again, kind of. So, you know, um, I don't know. I felt that uh, being able to, you know, I, I thought that was a pretty big jump, but I, I loved it. I went in and, you know, I went in and played soccer at Ryder, and they didn't tell me this, but freshman year, I could only play conference games. And you could, I couldn't play all the other I could only play nine out of our 14 games. And the first two games were non-conference games, so I, I wasn't playing. And I was like, I didn't expect that, because I, I felt like I'm going in there, I'm on the field, I'm ready to go, 
and we could, I could only play like limited nine games in college. Then it was different, but um, I don't know the di the difference. The difference is you, you just keep getting more serious and serious about your game. You know, you have to learn learn how to take control your time better in college because you're on a college campus now, and you got to take care of the academics. That was challenging to me. I'd say the biggest adjustment to me was, for me was. Um, how different the classrooms were, how much harder the classrooms were in college than they were in high school to me. There's Billy Gazonis. Can you hear me, Billy? Yeah, I can hear you, Bobby. How you doing, buddy? What's <laughs> going on, Billy? What are you doing there? I'm just, just trying to learn a little from you, Bobby. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're learning something from me, Billy. All right, that's funny. <laughs> People all read your book. These kids read your book yet, Billy? Uh, I, I don't know. You have to ask them that question. Yeah, you should read Billy Gazonis' book, all your listeners, especially young players, soccer players out there. How, how, this, how this guy right here, Billy Gazonis, got to play professional soccer, marking playing with some of the best players in the world that played in this country then, and how he went to Hartwick College. It was Herman Trophy winner. I don't know if you know what that means. That's the best college player in the country. And Trenton had two back-to-back -back Herman Trophy winners. I'll never forget. I saw... Billy, I saw Mooch's one time. I was over his house, and it was on, like, his, his TV, and his Mrs. Myronick was showing it to me. I was looking at it, and I, I, don't, I don't care what you achieve. You got that Herman Trophy for Player of the Year in college, and Trent had back-to-back -back Billy Gazonis, Mooch Myronick, and Billy, Billy's one of them. And he just wrote a book about his years at college at Hartwick, and you should really read it. It's a, it's, it's, I got it right over there, Billy, right over next to my bed, right there on that nightstand. <laughs> you gave it to me. So it's an honor to talk to you, Billy. Thanks for calling in. Uh, you're welcome, Bobby. Um, so, Tony, Wilson, Reggie, do any of you have questions from the audience or your own questions? Yeah, yes, I have one. Um, Bob, I, I found it interesting. Like, when I, when I started studying players, like professional players, I, I always I found it interesting. Like, especially as a player like Lamb, you probably know him, the German national player who was a captain and – you know, when you look at his history, he was like this great goal scorer growing up. And then he transitioned into being a defender. And obviously you had some great success at Ryder scoring goals. And so what was, how did that transition happen from goal scorer to defender? Well, I mean, back in the NASL, the North American Soccer League that I played in, when I got drafted by Philadelphia, um, in that league, there were very, very few forwards. So I felt like the best chance I had making an adjustment in that league, and I really think Al Miller, the coach that drafted me, saw me play in college against his Hartwick teams. We'd come up there in the winter, and we would give them – I went up with a Trenton team and played in Hartwick's indoor tournament. That's where the coach of Hartwick saw me, Al Miller. He ended up being an NASL coach in Philly, and he drafted me. And I really think he had in mind of having me play – drafting me as a defender. Um, he brought over English forwards and a couple Scottish guys. And I really don't think Americans were quite ready yet to play up front in the, in the more creative goal scoring. I'm not going to say they weren't ready. I'm going to say that they weren't given an opportunity to play as forwards. Because all the buddies of mine that came out my year and the year after me that were forwards, every game I go to, they're sitting over there on the benches. So... You know, that, that's, um, you know, um, that transition I made. I remember the uh, first game we played in St. Louis, and I'm, uh, I'm playing in the back, and I'm marking this guy, Gene Geimer, from St. Louis. I remember him from St. Louis University as All-American. I'm a couple years behind him, he's ahead of me, and I, I'm marking him now. And first couple minutes of this game, we get into it a little bit, and he's, he's a pretty physical guy, and I'm like, all right, here we go. This is what it's going to be like now, defending here. So – I'm, I got to be all about this now. I got to start challenging this. And I, I, you know, I started focusing and transitioning into a defender. I think it's an advantage having been a forward in my younger years to being a defender than in the, in the professional soccer. I think it helped me a lot. I know what forwards th they think. I know when I wanted to receive a ball. I knew how I wanted to turn on people. And, you know, I, I, I knew that from being on, on the offensive side of it. So that made that transition a lot easier for me becoming a defender, actually. So I, I took a lot of my offensive mindset and, you know, turned it against forwards that I was marking against. So 
you know, that was, uh, I, I didn't have a tough time with that because I was a pretty fitness oriented player. And I was a little, I had a little bit of aggression in me also when I was a center midfield or an attacking player. So I didn't have trouble with adjusting to the physical part of the game. Whereas mm. some forwards might have a little trouble with that part of the game, making that transition. Mm. Thank you. Anyone Very else have any other questions? There's a question from the audience. Um, Marlon Rossica would like to know what was your most memorable game and what impact did it have on you? Most memorable game of my life? Yes. That, that, that's what that is, yeah. I'm assuming that's what we You know, it's funny. It's funny because I think of, when I think of memorable games, all right, a couple of them are great results, but I think of the ones that, the losses, the biggest losses out there, they're the ones that stick with you the longest. I really think so. I mean, we lost to, we lost to Canada, a World Cup qualifying game in Haiti. And I just couldn't believe it. I was crushed losing to them because we had a chance of going to the World Cup that year. And we, had, we played them in, in Haiti, neutral site. And um, in the first 15 minutes, our center back, Captain Steve Petra, gets thrown out of the game, gets red carded. We're playing a man down against Canada. And I always felt like we, we, we could beat Canada. And we lost to them two to one in Haiti and knocked us out of the World Cup. I remember that as a memorable game. I'm sorry that it was, it's a memory because it was a tough, it was a tough loss. Uh, championship game, winning the NSL championship with the Adams that first year and me playing with, I mean, me and Bob Rigby got drafted by the Adams that year. We're two Americans on the field and I'm playing with all English players. Roy Evans is the left back. He played at Liverpool and become, and become Liverpool's uh, coach, coach of Liverpool. Chris Dunleavy was a um, Newcastle United defender. Derek Trevis was Southport and I was on the right. So three English players and me on the, on the right. And we won that championship that year in, in, against Dallas, in Dallas. And that game was like, you know, for my first year experience, winning a championship in the league we were in, was unbelievable, really, of a memory for me in, in a great way. You remember great wins, but you, you can't tell me that you look back on big games and the ones that you lost, the ones that hurt you a little bit, you kind of, you, you know, it, it, you remember them. What about Pele's farewell game, Bobby? Yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was pretty special, Pele's farewell game. He played um, half with uh, Santos of Brazil, and then he played half with us for the Cosmos. And um, that was a packed place. It was his uh, Pelé's farewell game. And he was loved by all of us, his teammates. And, um, you know, that was, a, that was very memorable because he was like, I mean, I played with Pelé those two years that he played in, the, in, uh, in New York. And it was like every time I'd come into the locker room and I would always be like, that's, there's, that's Pelé. I never got to the point where the teammate feeling, you know, like go over and hug him and say, hey, hey, how you doing, Pelé? You, you, I had so much respect for him and so awe of him. And his locker was a few down from mine. And it was uh, an unbelievable thrill to, to have played with him, Billy. You know, you played against him. And, um, you know, that, that was a very memorable game. You're, you're right, Billy, Pelé's farewell game. We just said love, love, loved everybody. A stadium full of people there. It was an honor to be on that field with, uh, with Pelé's retirement. You know, I have a great picture of him kind of hugging me after that game. And it's, uh, it, it was an honor to be associated with, with him on that Cosmos team, Billy. And the game was shown all around the world, Bobby, right? The whole world was watching that game, literally. I don't, I don't know, Billy. I don't know that. You know? Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. It was. Was it really? Yeah. I, really oh, yeah. Didn't <laughs> I just remember trying to carry him around the field after the game. And being so excited for him, I don't, I didn't, uh, I mean, it makes sense. I just didn't think things were that widespread from American soccer back then, you know? All right, so Mr. Smith, um, can we ask you, what, who were some key people that helped shape you as a professional player? Okay, um, as a professional player, I would say my first year now with the Adams, my first year now playing. I'm, I'm 21. And the guys I played in the back with, those Englishmen I told you about, Derek Trevis was a sweeper. He ended up coaching Mercer County Community College. 
and he coached a couple professional teams, and he was he was, he played behind me. He helped me so much learn my position. Um, and these guys were 30, 1, 32. A lot of those guys come over to this country, you know, and they had opportunities to play over here to extend their careers a little bit. And um, Derek Travis was, I mean, nobody would know his name now. I know maybe Billy, Billy might remember him from the Adams, I'm sure. Yeah. But uh, he, was, he was a sweeper, smart, and he read the game very well. And he would, he would be like um, always talking to me the whole game through different challenging situations. And, um, you know, he was certainly one of them. And then when I got to the Cosmos, I mean, you could pick anybody in that locker room to, to say that was a role model to me. I mean, I'm watching some of the best players. I'm in training playing against goal scorers like Giorgio Canalia, Dennis Stewart, and Pelé. And I'm playing in the back of Carlos Alberto sweeping behind me. I mean, that was – and he, he would always say – I could kid with him a little bit because uh, I always had a sense of – like the back four defenders were tight. It's just like a separate part of the team. I always kind of felt that way. I loved it, you know. And um, I can always remember Carlos on the, on the, on, as a, in the sweeper spot. His job was to kind of cover all the defenders. That's a sweeper's role back then. And I would always tell him, Carlos, just stay away from me. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get beat. I'm not gonna, nobody's going to run at you with the ball coming from our right side. It's just not – I can't allow that to happen. And he would always be like – he'd always be kidding me about, you know, Oh, Bob, with you over, with you on the right, I, I don't have to worry about you. And it was, it was a, like a compliment, unbelievable, that Carlos would give me because he liked having me on the right side of him. And to be honest with you, these guys I'm marking are like these fast little forwards, wingers from all, of, all different countries. And Carlos is like going on 34, 35 right now. I mean, greatest sweeper in the world, you know, but I, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to be running with some of these guys I'm trying to chase all over the field, you know. So I had to keep him like I, – I loved Carlos uh, playing behind me. He was – he would bring a ball down to the box with such calm nature. Billy, Billy knows, know, knows all about this nature. And Billy had this as a midfielder. Carlos would bring a ball down and just slip it to somebody and find somebody and not panic. I was more like under pressure, and I'd, I'd get a little bit more like, you know, like, uh, I don't know, just under, under pressure, feeling of being under pressure with the ball and looking up for people – and trying to get rid of it too quick sometimes. Carlos was so cool, calm down with the ball. And just like, whether I tried to learn from him or not, whether I learned very much from him or not, it's, you know, was unbelievable lessons to learn from these kind of players that I got to play with. Carlos Alberto is behind me. Beckenbauer is a midfielder in front of me with Bogushevitz from Yugoslavia. I mean, these, these players were just unbelievable role models that I got to play with, going right from the Adams through to the Cosmos. You know, unbelievable experience playing with those quality players. I always thought to myself, man, I, I, I'm on this field right now, and I'm trying to stay here. I want to stay, I'm going to work hard to stay here. I almost felt like, what am I doing out here with these guys? And it was funny because Pelé would always be one of the players that would grab a hold of you and show you that you were as important as anybody else on the field. That was, what it, that was Pelé, how special play was. He never thought like, well, who, you know, who's this American kid in the back here? What, 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 you know, what's he done, you know? Play was like that. We were living, living of us on the field. We all have a job to do. And play and Carlos, those guys were so cool with respecting what each player had to do as a, the job on the field. I love them guys for that. Wow. John, do you have any questions for Mr. Smith? Yeah, Mr. Smith. So from what I hear, you've played with a lot of icons, like soccer icons. Who would you say you looked up to the most while you were a player? As an opponent? As an opponent, as a teammate, whoever it may be, just who well, did you? I mean, you know, I, I start off with my own locker room in New York, you know, <laughs> and I, I would look up to a guy that nobody would kind of know, Terry Garbett, played in front of me on the right midfield, and I played behind him for a couple of years. And we had this thing, me and Terry, where we kind of had an understanding. It's such a thrill to have almost nonverbal communications with each other. I loved it. And Terry would always say, this team, we're, we're not getting beat down the right side today, Bobby. And I'd be like, let's, let's go, Terry, let's go. You know, so, I mean, those are players that I just looked up to. And then as far as opponents go, I mean, I'm marking George Best one week. I'm marking Johan Cruyff another week. I'm mar I marked Eusebio once. I mean, these were like Rodney Marsh. I mean, it's Stuart Scullion, guys that you wouldn't know the names of. Billy, you mentioned one of them in your book, Warren Archibald, Trinidad. I mean, five foot 
six, 150 pounds dripping wet, but lightning fast. And you, he's not a big world known player. But I had to mark him on Miami and he played for Miami Toros. I marked him a couple of times and I'm telling you, you, you better just pack a lunch and be ready to go because he's nonstop moving. And the, the challenge of marking against players like that, Johan Cruyff was like, I mean, you can't let these players receive a ball and face you. You can't. If they get to face you with the ball, they're gone. And you might as well be sitting up in the bleachers up there paying, buy, buying a ticket to watch a game. You can't. You couldn't let them receive a ball and face you. I had to my, – my biggest focus, and we've talked about this, was the, just reading the service of, of the ball. Somebody in the midfield, somebody's got the ball, and they're looking to, to release it to a forward, let's say, and you've got to be able to read that service quickly and jump to it and deny them the ball. Because once they have the ball, then they can't turn on you. And if they get the ball and turn on you, you're, you're done. These kind of players – Johan Cruyff, I can remember him a couple times getting the ball, and he's not even looking at me now. He's looking at how he's going to beat the, the second defender behind me. He's not even worried about me. I'm like, I'm like sitting there going like, hey, hey, I'm right in front of you. You got to beat me first, you know. But uh, I mean, these these players were were so talented that I got the thrill, the honor of playing against these guys. George George Best, unbelievable. You, you dream about these guys all your life, and now I'm on the field marking them. So it was, uh, you know. Unbelievable honor. Yeah, I can imagine. It's really cool we got to play with those kind of players, for sure. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Such, such a thrill. I hope you, you, hope you all get, get a chance in your lives to be around people that you've thought that much of at one point in time and be, on the same, be in the same environment with them, you know? Right, yeah. Um, Devin, do you have a question? Yeah, um, following up John's question, obviously you play, played with, like, the all-time greats, some of the all-time greats. At one point in time, were you, like, intimidated at all? Well, that's a good question. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, Devin. I went, on a, I went on a soccer field, and I went, once I crossed that white line to go on a soccer field, it was like, let's go. We're, we're going here. Now, I don't care. George Best, I read all about you. And if you go out there even thinking of – what you're up against as far as the level of these, 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 the talent of these players. If there was one, probably the strongest thing I had going for me was maybe my just kind of blind ignorance to like, I, I don't really care who you are. You know, I'm going out there and I am, I'm not going to be intimidated because uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm a soccer player. You're a soccer player. Let's go. We got 90 minutes here. And I, I honestly, Devin, um, I'm telling you that I don't ever remember being intimidated on a soccer field. If I, I think that would be a lack of preparation. It would be a lack of confidence and pride in what you do. I, I, I just don't, I, I don't recognize that as, uh, as an emotion that you, you can never have on a, on a sport field, on a soccer field. You know, that can only hurt you a little bit. And I can remember sometimes where there would be teammates of mine that would respect an opposing team and players so much. And I'd be wondering to myself, like, okay, I know this, this guy's unbelievable. These are tremendous players, but we're not going to be standing off of them and, and, and being a little bit intimidated by, by how good we, we got We got to get in here. And I remember far in, in import play, foreign players doing that with each other. I guess they would call it like a matter of respect, I didn't feel that way because I, 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 didn't, I didn't have that sense. I, I respect you. You know, game's over. I respect you. The game's on. You're, you know, you, you're going to – you, you got to be ready to go. 90 minutes, we're going here. And um, I'll respect you when the game's over. When the game is on, I, I, I am not intimidated by you one little bit, you know. I, I, you can't do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Tony Wilson, Reggie, are there any questions from the audience or – Yourself. Yeah, Bob, what were those moments like in practice when you were going against Pele and Canalia? I mean, that was game on every practice for you. I mean, what was that like? Well, okay. Now, you say game on. You have to remember now it's practice, right? And in order for me to get something out of practice, to prepare, prepare me for a game, I've got to get into it and I, I've got to go hard. 
I don't have the luxury of taking practice easy because I'm the best midfielder in the world. And I'm, um, I, I've got to, I really have to do extra fitness work. And the way that I approached it was I had a habit of always getting lined up against on the other side with Pelé. And we had this little thing, believe it or not, where Pelé would, I would always try to receive. I'm, in, in our scrimmages, and it, most, most of it's just 7v7 stuff. We're just playing across the field and we're, we're going. And the guys are, we're playing Wednesdays and Saturdays. So training to them was kind of nice and easy. I, I, I can't afford a nice moment on that field in training. I've got to be going. And I only had the respect of the players because I was a first team member and they know what I have to do on Saturday and, and, and game day. So I, I've got to be allowed to, to get in to win tackles and win balls in training. And I, I would always try to be very careful with that because, you know, you, you, you go in and hurt a player in, in training because, you know, being kind of stupid, you know, it's, it's not the, the, a team thing to do. But I, I've got my job to do. And in order for me to do my job on Wednesday, I've got to do it every day. I got to prepare for it. So I can remember being – now, Pelé's on the other team. I line up against the forwards on Pelé's team, and I'm trying to read where Pelé's going to serve a ball. That was the enjoyment I got out of training competitively. And, you know, I think I was like, oh, for 5,000 and try to read where he plays the ball. Seriously. He was so gifted with his vision of the game. You just don't know where he's playing the ball. And – I'm trying to read from the best server of the ball in the world. And that's what, that's how I felt better about training is reading it and reading it and look at, looking at him and, and trying to figure out which forwards favor, which foot and, and, and challenging them in a way, put, always puts them on their weak side, always put somebody on, on their weaker side. About and I, I had to learn as, a, as opponents, how they preferred to receive a ball and how they come at you with their favorite foot. They want to, I mean, if you get a guy that strikes a ball left foot upper upper ninety, well, that's the last time he's touching the ball with his left foot that day. I mean, you just you can't allow that. If he does it again, you push him inside to his right. He does it again with your right. Well, then then you got some work cut out for you. You know, you're, you're in a world of trouble then. But um, you know, the the, tra the training part of it was uh, you know, le learning in in training was trying to trying to read the surface of the ball even in practice every day. That's what I have to do on the. Week and chasing Dennis Tort and chasing and with Canalia, a bigger guy like Canalia. There's the Dennis Tort, a little English guy that 100 miles an hour, and there's a target player like Canalia. And I learned how the difference was to defend those two players. Canalia likes to use his body on you, big, strong target player. I can't let him get into me. I've got to stay off of him one side or the other and get in front of him immediately to, to try to win that ball. You can't let a big target player like him. And there was Quite a few of them in the league back then. I remember Clyde Bess, and I had the privilege of marking some Gerd Mueller's target players. And I learned a lot from Kinaya as far as not letting him back into you. Now he's just using his body weight against yours, and you're not going to muscle a guy like that. You've got to get off him. I wouldn't mark him as tight because I thought that was quicker than him, but I'm going to beat him to a ball rather than get blocked in and let him shield and receive it. You know, so... I don't know. Those are a couple of things in training that I would try to focus on getting me ready for the game. Everybody's got to get ready for their game and what's expected of them on game day. And you got to do it in training. Teams off the field, I'm running the stadium. Up, up and down, the, around the whole stadium after, after training. I need that work. You know, Bogey's a midfielder, best in the world. Beckenbauer's been, they don't need that work. I need that work. I've got to put that extra work in to make sure that there's, I, I, I don't fail fitness-wise at all on that field. And, and I got to be ready to go. I can't let down. You know, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's chiefs, there's big shots on field, and then there's Indians on field that do the, that, that, that got to, got to get to work. I was one of those guys. You know, I had to, I had to outfitness everybody, and I would try to do that on my own team. In training. Mm. How's that for rambling? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You can go right, Billy. We talk soccer, Billy. We go or what? Come on. Yeah, Bobby, I just talked to your old coach this afternoon, Al Miller, and he didn't stop for like an hour straight. He, he didn't stop what, Billy? Al Miller, he didn't stop talking for like an hour straight. About what? Al Miller. Uh, just the get, we were just talking about soccer, basically. Uh, yeah, the yeah, Barcelona, I know. The Barcelona-Bayern Munich game the other day. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, that's the soccer community. Once they get going, I'd have a guy like Billy, you know, Dave DeRico. He was another Herman Trophy winner from Hartwick, one of my best friends, national teammate. I pick him up at the airport one time. We're, and, and it's, we're, we're like 40 years old now. And he's talking about this game we played against Italy. And we got beat. And we're on my front lawn. He's like, remember we played against Kanaya. And he's out there, Billy, like he's like, he's like we're replaying his game and his challenge and his tackle that he made. It's like, oh, man, we, you know, a community, it's like, you know, it's a brotherhood. Yeah. The story, the stories just, you know, they just keep coming. Hopefully none of us, you know, ever made a bad play as we get older. You know, every, everything was good plays back, you know, when you look back on it. Hey, Bobby, M Mike Legoski wants to know who was the toughest guy you have ever had to mark in your career. Who wants to know that? Mike Legoski. Mike Legoski, okay. Toughest guy to mark? Well, I mean, I would have to say the biggest challenge is marking was Johan Cruyff just stands out. He was so fast. He would go from standing position and he'd take off like a deer and in about two steps, Reggie, he's full speed. Mm. Now, there aren't many players that can do that. You know, you, most players, they, 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 they take a little bit to get to their top speed. He was just, he could accelerate like nobody I've ever seen. So he was, he was the most difficult mark challenge I had on a soccer field, I would, I would say. And then George Best, I mean, come on, you know. George Best, I remember marking him in L.A. a couple times. And, you know, he didn't have the best reputation for his off-field behavior, I, which I could care less about. He was one of the greatest players that ever played. And he'd come on the field, and I'm marking him, and it'd almost be like today he was kind of like, just taking it easy, kind of cruising around. And I remember saying to him a few times, George, I mean, George, George, these people are here to see you play. Now I'm trying to encourage him to just light it up. Because if he can light it up and I can mark him, I know that I've done. If he's out there lazy and around and not caring much about that game that day, I'm not too happy because it's, it's not what I expect of him. I want to see him. And I would get into him a little bit and I'd say, you're, you know, you're, George, you're making a lot of money here. Come on now, show these people why we've read about you and we've dreamt about you all our lives. You know, show this country you're over here now. And I would, I, I can remember trying to spark him up to get him going. I, I didn't want him to get him too going because he beat me, you know. But, um, you know, he, he had, he was another player that he gets, he gets running at you with a ball. Just forget about it, you know. I never marked Pelé. And I had a little joke with Pelé you know, about play. If I get traded, you know, I'm, I'm coming back for you. And we would kind of joke about it a little bit. He was just such, a, such an uh, awesome guy to, to relate to and kid with a little bit that way, you know. But um, there's, there's a lot of players. I mean, I, you know, I mentioned Warren Archibald before. And I, I can remember on the national team, a couple, I don't even remember the guy's name, a couple Mexican forwards I'm trying to chase for 90 minutes. I've got a picture of the back four of the national team, three Jersey guys, me, me, Mooch, Dave, Dave Dorico, and, and Denny Witt from Baltimore. And we're marking Mexico. They're playing us in Puebla, Mexico, 10,000 feet altitude. And we're chasing this team. And I don't, I don't remember who these, who, I don't even remember the guy's name I was marking, but his guy wouldn't stop. And it was so challenging. I have a picture of us at halftime. I love this picture for you young guys here. I, I hope you have a picture like this someday of you coming off a field. We're coming off at halftime, and they, they caught this picture of the four of us, and we looked like it was, it was brutal. We are just shot out. And that's – I love that picture because it shows you what, what sports is like. You, you want to go down this road. You want to, you know, play at the highest level, and you want to fight and work hard and, and give up a lot of things and make a commitment to something. I mean, this is what it looks like. It's not holding up trophies and, and hanging, hanging, putting championship rings on your fingers. It's that picture right there that I remember so well. And we went in at halftime 0-0 in Pueblo. We ended up losing that game, but I'll, I just remember that picture. That picture to me is, is what I wanted to do all my life. That, that was it, you know? That, showed, that, that to me showed what it takes to get, to get on that field with the U.S. national team. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, I, have a, I was enjoying listening to you, how you, you – your memories, that's really good. But I have a question. You, you say like 
you play next to Carlos Alberto and Pelé. Did you receive any advice from them to like ad, uh, improve your, perfor your performance as a soccer player? And who's the nasty player you had to cover? The nastiest player I had to cover? Yeah. Okay, let, let's go to, I guess, Pelé and Carlos first. Carlos would help me a lot about when to just be a little more careful challenging people and going in too early on somebody, just little soccer things. I mean, it's, it's, it's very technical things that only soccer players would understand in this conversation we're having of how, the, how, how they would influence me, these players, you know, and how to calm down sometimes. They would always kind of get me like, don't be full of fire all the time. Carlos would be like, relax. And Carlos was so relaxed. I mean, you know, I, I just couldn't imagine. But, you know, there were times when, in the heat of a game, Carlos had to challenge somebody physically. And I'm telling you, he went in with blades that were, like, smoking. He'd go in so hard. And you'd almost think he didn't have it in him. But you don't get to where he was in Brazil playing soccer if you don't have the blades on also. He was a hard player. But the rest of his game was so smooth and beautiful. And, you know, Pelé is a, is, a, is a forward. He would teach me, Pelé would, in, in training and in practice. He would look at me and he'd kind of laugh because he knew that I, I over-challenged a certain ball that he got behind me. And he would kind of laugh a little bit about it because he knew I was trying to catch up to a ball he's serving or read him. And that's, that's, just, that's just honor. That's like, you know, a uh, relationship you have with them. He's not going to sit me down and try to tell me how to trap a ball. I mean, we all know how to do certain things. But it was, you know, a lot of just like in-game experiences of, of what's going on in certain situations that I would learn from those guys, mostly by watching them, actually. Nastiest, um, nastiest player to play against. Um, trying to think. It was a couple, it was a couple nasty players that I had to end up marking in game situations sometimes that, you know, you, you, you just have to, like, you got to go in. You know, you got you to challenge them. And uh, it's, it's, there's times – I remember playing against a – playing with a defender, Randy Martinovich, in Philly. He was a Philadelphia Fury guy, Yugoslavian guy. Kind of like 5'10", 160-pound defender. He was so brave. He taught me courage. He would go into tackles. He would be chasing a ball across down. Billy, Billy and uh, Vito, you guys I see on the, on the screen here, so, no, in soccer, he's, a ball gets played, a, a ball from the sidelines gets crossed over. And he's chasing on to it. He wouldn't take his eyes off that ball. Here comes this big forward ready to come on and volley this ball. If you take a look and you look off the ball for a minute and you pull out of that tackle because this guy's coming to volley, I mean, it's so tempting to do that. I, he, he showed me how to commit to the ball defensively and just almost like I thought he was nuts because he'd go into challenge. And I'm like, I, I was thinking like he, he, he's seriously risking his health. But he would like be such, he had so much courage. He was so brave. And he was a no name defender for Yugoslavia over here, second, third division Yugoslav player, because he was only a marking back like I was. So his, you wouldn't know his name. And, uh, you know, that, that's, that was our position that we played. I can remember him being fearless on the field, 5'10, 160 pounds, afraid of nothing. I, I, I love those experiences and learning from people like that, you know? Thank you, Bob. We, have a bunch of people on the call who've given us an hour every Sunday night. I have a young lady who has a question. I just want to make sure we get all the audience questions in. Okay. She's a new soccer player. She's going to be an absolute star. She's dynamite. Her name's Christiana, and she wants to know, what advice would you give soccer players who are passionate about the game? That's from Christiana? Yes. Christiana, uh, you know, if you're passionate about the game, you're already like, you know, you're already on your way because that's, that's got to be first. If, you, if you're not passionate, if you don't care a whole lot and you have to train and you got to push yourself in training. Um, I remember Mia Hamm saying things like, you'll never die from fitness. You're not going to die out here. You're going to get tired. So deal with it. So, I mean, you, my, my advice to you is surround yourself with players that are committed as you are and push each other in training, you know, your best friend, your biggest challenges, the girls you play against that are as fit and strong as you are your best teachers. And they'll be your best friends as you go forward. 
and you, the girls that you battle, that you're challenged against, that are, that are competition for you, they're making you better players. There's no way I became the player I was without the challenges of some of the forwards I had to play against making me, making me a better player. But your attitude, you just stay committed and focused on your approach and your game. Love your teammates. You know, be proud of yourself. Be mentally – in the, in the girls' game, I have to say this to you, Christian. I, I, I coached the, the New Jersey State uh, U18 girls for co- quite a few years. Best females in New Jersey players. I had them for like two, three years. Lo- loved every minute of it. And I felt the biggest contribution I could make to them was making them mentally a little bit tougher, mentally, mentally stronger player. Things are going to go right. Things are going to go wrong. You're going to have problems. And to mentally stay tough and stay strong inside yourself and not get affected by things is very important. Very important for everybody. But female players, I think it's very important that they, they continue to develop mental strength. I hope you know what that means, Christiana. You know, in the course of a game, things don't go your way. You hang up. I see Carly Lloyd play. I don't see an emotion. I don't see her budge. I just see her work and work and outperform. And I saw that of a lot of the female players that I used to watch on the national team. Mentally tough. I, I don't want to insult them by saying they play like guys, but they just played serious, solid. And my only comparison to that was guys I played with all my life. So it's not insulting. It's, it's, I'm, I'm complimenting them as far as being strong mentally and, you know, keep, keep, keep working on your game. It's, it's a beautiful thing. You'll love it. Whatever level you go to and play, you'll take the memories and the, you'll take the strength that you gain from it and you'll be a better person. You'll be somebody people want to employ as in the job. You'll be somebody, somebody wants to work next to because of the character you're developing right now in your game. Bob, thanks for that. Sebastian, before you close us out, Bob, just one observation from Ken Andrews. He said he's watched your entire career from high school, and your greatest strength was that you were always the hardest worker on the field. Just wanted to share that with you. That's an awesome thing to say to be said about somebody. I really appreciate that from Kenny. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Reggie, yep. for, for giving me those kind words. Appreciate it. Sebastian, hold hold one second, if you will. I don't know if we could make this possible, but Bob, there's a there's a a Ecuadorian national player on the call who played against Maradona, defended against him. Wilson, I don't know if you're able to bring him on and uh, can translate for him, but I think it would be a great moment to have him uh, okay, with us. Uh, you let want to see. speak, Toma? Okay, let me see what is. You can open to... Yeah, if you can let him know, I'm just going to unmute him. Yeah, I want to take him right now. Hold on. My wife's, gonna, Argentinian. My wife's Argentinian, guys. She speaks Spanish, so I need her here. <laughs> Wilson will translate. Wilson's been right. in touch with him. He's going to be joining in our call, hopefully right. joining as one of our speakers, but he joined this week. And it's Maradona. It. She's Argentinian as well. Look out. <laughs> Pablo, me escucha. Let's see Pablo. if he can. Uh... He may have stepped away. Oh, there he is. Oh, okay. Pablo, puede prender su micrófono? O oh, Tony. Yeah. Okay. Ahí estoy. Escucha. Okay, he's listening now. Uh, okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, we, we spoke already about him. He spoke with Pelé. So, eh, él, él está queriendo hacer una pregunta o si usted tiene alguna pregunta que hacerle hacia él. Él le puede escuchar. Uh, Mr. Smith, do you want to make any questions to him? Or also, he's going to ask you something. Pablo, ¿tiene alguna pregunta? Sí. Eh, voy a intentar hacer lo más corto para que lo pueda traducir bien. Sí. Okay. Eh, lo especial que fue Pelé, lo especial que fue Pelé en su forma de jugar, él jugó con él, ¿verdad? Si me corrige. Sí, sí correcto. Eh, lo especial que son esos jugadores cuando, cuando jugamos con jugadores grandes eh, tienen una característica de ver las fútbol diferente quieren que todos jueguen a su mismo nivel ¿qué tan difícil fue adaptarse al juego de Pelé cuando le tienes a un jugador con esa característica y siempre exige que los compañeros sean 
bastante ideales a él o bastante parecidos a él para poder jugar. Ok, uh, Mr. Smith, he's Pablo Marín, he plays for Ecuadorian national team, and he covered to Maradona in the Copa America Argentina 1997. So, he has a question for you. He first was... All, excuse me, first of all, congratulate him for me. Tell him it's an honor to speak to him, Ecuadorian uh, national team player, and tell him I'm, I'm, I'm proud of him. I'm glad to be, on the, be able to speak to him. Uh, Dice que tiene un honor hablar con usted, con una persona que ha jugado nacional a nivel profesional y, y especialmente de una selección de fútbol de Ecuador. ¿Está bien? Uh, ok, Mr. Smith, Pablo has a question for you. Pele was a special uh, soccer player. The characteristics of how difficult was to uh, uh, adapting to, to play on his way. Like always the soccer players, like the level of Pelé, asking for challenge every time. How do you do? How, how do I adjust to Pelé's game? Yes. Well, I mean, players like, he mentioned Maradona and Pelé. Adjusting to their game means finding their feet with the ball. Because that's when, if you can find those type of dangerous players, if they, you can find them with the ball as their teammates, then they, they, they're the show. The job is for us to find him. The job for the Argentinian players were to find Maradona's feet. And once, once you have that quality of a player, I mean, I, the job of, his, of the teammates are to find him, to find him in space, release the ball at the right time to bring them into the game because they're going to be marked by monsters in the back. Uh, Pablo's one of them marking, marking uh, So you've got your timing of releasing a ball to these to your your players, uh, your teammates has to be perfect so that they can you know you have to adjust to their game. You got to find their feet, bring them into the game. I think that's what is that if that's what he's asking me. Okay, Pablo. Lo que él me contesta que oh, I think I um is. Es, es difícil encontrar así como ellos pasan la pelota y que, que ellos cada vez que se juega con un nivel de jugadores del nivel de ellos, ellos aprenden cada rato y cada día. Pero que fue eh, un desafío, también jugó al, al nivel de él. No le escucho bien si le prende el micrófono. Ok, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Ok, Pablo. Nice, nice meeting you. Nice to meet you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Tony. Uh, okay, Sebastian, do you want to close this out? Uh, sure. So um, one final question, though, um, Mr. Smith. Is there someone else like yourself that you think would be a good speaker for our audience that you could recommend to us? I think Billy Gazonis would be a good person for you to speak to as a professional player, a player from Trenton that played professionally. I think Bob Rigby, my national teammate, goalkeeper, I played with for many years, one of my best friends, as well as Billy. I think Bobby Rigby, I think Bobby Rigby would be a good guest on your show as well. Um, these are two local, local guys, local, local players. Um, I mean, uh, as far as other players go, I mean, I, I, It'd be great. I mean, it'd be quite a quite a pleasure to get on somebody on the phone like a Bogicevic from Yugoslavia, that lives in the New York area. You know, um, other players in this area. I mean, there's you know, there's Billy, there's Bobby Rigby, there's uh, a couple Philadelphia players I played with. That uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I think anybody that played at the high level, certainly U.S. national team players. I mean, you get Dave Dorico on the on the on the air with on the phone with you. He, he's he's scary character even to this day. You know, hard carny soccer player. I played with him many years. Loved him. Learned a lot from him. I, I don't know. There's 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 people around that I would love to see you guys talk to that could give you a whole another outlook on on their careers. Yeah, next week we're actually doing um, Billy Gonzalez. Are you really? Billy Gonzalez, yeah. That's awesome. That's a great great role model for you, right from your town. Sebastian. Yeah, sure. Thank you. That's a good deal. 
Um, so as a closing, uh, we just want to take a moment and thank the audience, uh, our special speaker, and all of our special guests tonight. Uh, we hope to see you next week where we, we will be interviewing Billy Gonzo sorry, Billy Gazones, Billy Gazones, a local standout and Herman Trophy winner and author. Uh, have a nice night and thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bob, if you could stay on for just a couple minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. Good job. Right. Good seeing you, Bobby. Okay. You too, Billy. All right. Good night, everybody. Bob, if you could just stay on with our team for a few minutes, that'd be great. I got you. Yeah.